Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm a biostatistician. Um, so to, to, to show my age and my location, I was taught SAS by Ross E. Harker in 1990. Um, current maintainer for a few, a, few, a few packages, and I'd like to acknowledge my, my, my funders and my collaborators. Okay, so um, I thought what I could do is I could sort of basically start off by sort of saying well, what, what are some of, some of the questions that you, you could ask me at the end of the um, um, of the presentation and so it's so like how is the micro simulation package different to the um, uh, decim package, why did we develop the, the package, why not just, just use ESIM, um, is event oriented discrete event simulation really that? flexible and why don't you just use an arc of model um, and when is it worthwhile writing the um, simulation in C++ so we can come back to those questions. So we, we had a challenging research question and what we wanted to do was we wanted to evaluate the um, cost effectiveness of, of, of a range of prostate cancer screening strategies and that could, could include no screening or screening with different start and stop ages and rescreening intervals but we also want to investigate different screening tests and different biopsy te technologies um, um, Ed Nakini suggested that we, we, we look at um, um, that we also look at uh, looking at uh, the introduction of genetic risk scores and we want to think about risk stratified screening based on test levels so it's it, it's it's more complex. Um, and so we've got a natural history component and we've got a screening component and we've got a clinical component. And well, what we're doing is we're trying to find a um, sort of like a, a, a model framework that is appropriate for, for the, the research question. So what I did a long time ago was um, I developed a, a cervical cancer screening model using triage pro, which was discrete time and de deterministic. And then we sort of, um, use some outlines and use lots of clones and tunnel states. And it, it, even with that flexibility, it was still difficult to sort of combine the, um, the natural history and screening states. So I wouldn't, after trying it once, I would not recommend it again. Um, an alternative would be, be to use in, in, um, individual based continuous time Markov or semi Markov models, um, such as using. PSIM, and that's really nice because you can uh, incorporate your individual heterogeneity um, well, and you can have different timescales. So that's cool. But the, the challenge is for the model specification is how do we combine the natural history and the screening states? And um, it's unclear whether um, the, the, the current frameworks are sufficiently flexible. So as a third broad class, um, 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 uh, we looked at using event oriented discrete event simulation. It's, um, it's, it's well established. It's also exceedingly flexible. So you, you can have um, in, in individual attributes um, to, to do with your, your natural history and or screening history and or um, treatment history and that can affect the um, simulation in a number of ways. You can also allow for um, resource allocation as we've seen from um, Cohen and um, all, all of these these models are based on you've got an un underlying event queue and then you sort of basically you pull out the, the next event and then you change the event queue. So um, so what we do is we've got data coming in as the number of simulations and the other parameters and things that we, we, we want out. Um, we want to report for the expected qualities and costs. So um, for the, um, um, the, the, we initialize the full simulation, which means that we set up some report. And then we've got a large loop for the number of individuals. And then for each in, in individual, we set up an initialization and it's using um, the init method here. Where well, what that does is that clears the event queue, um, sets the attributes to their um, default values, um, set some individual attributes, and then asserts the initial events into the event queue, and that's using this, this method schedule at. And then what we do is, given the event queue, we basically pull out the next event, and we handle that. And, um, and, and, and we use the handle message 
the new method here, and what that does is that it updates the um, current time and, um, the, the, and then responds to, to, to the event, possibly by updating um, some, some of the attributes or inserting new events or canceling events. So our requirements, we, we wanted an event oriented uh, discrete event simulation. We wanted to do the data management before and after an hour. We wanted to um, actually have the engine for doing the simulations either in R or in C++. And the reason that we wanted to think about C++ is that if you want to do a probabilistic analysis with 10 strategies, with a 1,000 parameter sets, and what we would typically do is either have 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8 individual sims per set, then we need at least 10 to the 10 individual simulations. And that's actually quite a moderately big task. We also wanted some tools for doing HTA, and we, um, we, we had a preference for a GPL license. Um, our, uh, our solution was to um, the, the develop a, a package which used R-based sims based on reference classes, and I'll show you an, an example of that. And that's also semantically equ equivalent to this sim, but it actually looks a bit different so far as the um, syntax. Um, we, we, we also uh, have a C++ engine based on an, on an established library and for doing 10 to the 10 sims takes about four days on a 40 core node and the R version is about 50 times slower so that we'd be waiting for a very long time. Um, but this does re require programming in C++ and I think um, that there's already been, already been a very nice presentation about Julia um, which neatly avoids the um, two language problem. Um, we make extensive use of RCPP, and, and I think some of the things that we've done well is we allow common random numbers at the C++ level, but using the R random number generators. And we, we also allow for inline model de development for, for the, for the um, C++ code, and it's now on CRAN. Yay! Um, the R API, what we've got is we've got a current time attribute or a now method and they're, um, they're equivalent. We've got a, a previous event time attribute. Then we've got a schedule at for scheduling new events. We've got a clear method which removes all of the events. We've got a, a, a cancel method to test, um, for, for testing whether to remove an event. Um, and then we've got the init, which we um, that the user needs to define, which basically sets things up, and the handle message, which is um, um, how to, to respond to each of the events. There's also a final for just basically um, what to, to return at the end. Um, this probably makes a lot more sense if you see an example. So what we do is um, we, we, we install from CRAN and then uh, use the, um, the, the micro simulation package. Um, and then we um, define a reference class called ticking, which is um, which, which uses the um, base discrete events simulation class. So we have defined this here. So, and then for that class, we, we, we define two methods. Um, we've got init, which schedules um, a tick um, at, at an exponential time. And then it does a, a coin toss here um, to, to, to see whether there's an explosion. And then it also um, does some reporting. Then for the um, handle message, which is actually called for each event, then we do some reporting. Then we, um, then we, we, we decide that we're gonna clear the, the events um, and then schedule possibly schedule some more events. So if there's an explosion, then it stops. But if there isn't an explosion, then it sort of does either a tick or a talk. Um, and then it also um, schedules for a new explosion. Set the seed, you do it ticking, new, and then you run. And then that gives you this output here where you get the begin and end times and then the, um, the, um, the status here and then you, you get an explosion. And that's the um, simple example. 
what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through the sicker example in continuous time. Um, probably going to run out of time to do this in detail. Uh, um, I think most of you have seen the um, six sickers. You start off in a healthy state, then you can become sick or sicker, and then you've got transitions to, to death. You can also go from the sick back to healthy. Um, note that this was formulated in discrete time, and there's no direct transition from healthy to sicker. Um, well, I think I think it's a, a year increment, um, and what you actually find is uh, that there should be a um, there should actually be a direct transition here, which would be approximately the product of this and this. I haven't changed the notation, so Devin would probably sort of um, say that I've used a, a mix of notation, but I've actually kept um, the notation. Uh, those are the parameters that came um, from um, the original paper. Um, and then I've also sort of tried to sort of like uh, go from discrete time to continuous time. I've added in that product for going from the, the healthy state um, um, to, the, this is a probability of going from the healthy state to the sicker state. And then I've used a, um, a matrix log to get the transition rates. And then I've plugged those into the parameters. So param ha um, has all of the um, uh, transitions available. Then what we do, we're calling the, um, the, the microsome package, defining the um, class, um, inheriting from the um, base discrete event simulation. And then we, we define these fields for the cumulative qualities for each individual, cumulative costs for e each individual, the sort of current cost, the current utility, and the current state. Then the init method says that everyone starts out being, um, being healthy with zero cumulative costs, with the current um, cost being that for um, being in the um, healthy state and the um, current utility for being in the healthy state. And then we've got transitions from going, going to, to sicker or to death or to the end of follow-up. I also to define a, um, a short routine which cancels out um, um, the um, all of the transitions from healthy uh, to uh, sick and to sicker and to death, but it keeps the, um, um, so this um, will not be removed. And then what we do is we uh, essentially, um, in the handle message method, we do updating for the qualities, updating for the costs. And then we just handle for each of the different types of events. So if we're actually moving too healthy, then we do pretty much what we had before. But what we do is we cancel out any of the existing events except for the two um, end of um, follow up. Then for, for moving to, um, uh, to sick, we change the state, we change the utility, we change the costs, we cancel the, the, the events and schedule three new events. Then if we move to sicker, we change the state, we change the utilities, we change the costs, we cancel the events, and we just can um, and then we, we then we just schedule for going um to death. And then if we actually um do have an event where we go to, to death or to end of follow-up, we clear and we do, do nothing else, and that will end the um sim. And then we've got a final method where we just basically want to get out the um cumulative qualities and the costs here. So to run this, we set the seed. We say that they're going to be, um, they're not going to be treated. We, we set up the model and then we run the, the model a, a thousand times. And then we change it so that they, they are being treated, run the model. And then all I've shown here is just the, the, um, the sort of the, 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 the means for those that are untreated and the, the means um, and the scenarios for those that are treated. Now, I could have um, done a lot more with that. But I think the, the main point is I wanted to talk through the um, presentation of the approach. Uh, there's also a C++ implementation and we, we, we've used that for, for doing prostate cancer modeling and here are some references. Um, and um, we are also currently recruiting. I've got two, two positions um, 
open for um, um, if someone's in, interested in um, John Nash to do some cancer screening modeling. I've got a postdoc position and an RA position. I've also got a PhD position in variational approximations. So I'm not sure this is the um, right audience. And finally, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Super. Thanks very much, Mark. And uh, great painting on this opportunity to try and find uh, appropriate people for the for the roles. Um, I like the way that you referenced uh, how long you've been in this broad area of research, but I think you were the first presenter to include emojis in your presentation uh, so far on these past two days, I think, maybe. Um, I'll, if anybody, does anybody have any questions? Um, I know Howard uh, raised an issue in the chat. Howard, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, sure. So, Mark, obviously, great presentation and microsimulation is an incredibly clever piece of programming. Um, I was just wondering, have you ever considered going backwards and implementing an individual level semi markup model or even a cohort markup model and seeing how different the screening recommendations would be? So basically trying to get at whether the DES is the minimal model necessary for healthcare decision making in this area. Uh, the, 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 the difficulty is that you would be having to make, so I've got an additional slide, which I didn't show. Um, if you simplify the model, then your implicit assumptions become much heavier. Um, if you, um, the um, discrete event, um, your explicit assumptions are heavy. Um, and I think my recommendation is that if, for, for cancer screening, I think the advantage of having a fairly De detailed natural history model will actually mean that you'll, yeah, it's sort of, even if you get the natural history slightly wrong, I think the experiment within that is going to be more valid than actually trying to get an expert to sort of say what they believe would happen to the mortality rate ratios. Um, so I, I, I think I think it's fairer. Um, it, it's it's really hard within this, within this particular context to do something which is simpler. I think that's my, like, I agree with you. The DES is definitely the, the most appropriate here to capture the disease history and then the interaction with the screening strategies. I'm just wondering if it would be possible to make those strong assumptions for a simpler model and see how wrong it is, because this would apply to other disease areas where these simpler approaches are used. We could say, well, we shouldn't be doing that because in prostate cancer screening, you get the totally wrong answer. Yeah, so I've thought about this. A little bit, um, and I, I, I think it's probably true that if you happen to use the right assumptions within the Markov model, then you'll get the right answer. So you're more sensitive to your wrong structural assumptions in the Markov model. Like if you happen to choose one of the hundred options, you'll get the right answer, but in 99 other cases, you'll be wrong. I no, I think I'm more sort of saying, um, I mean. If you wanted to validate a Markov model, then you could just choose the right parameters and then you'd actually sort of come to the right conclusion. Um, I think um, I, I think the I think the discrete event is probably slightly more robust to misspecification of some of the key parameters. Um, but that's I mean I you can always show that your model is better than another by careful choice of the, the inputs. You can always show that you, you, your model is worse as well. So I, I think it's a, um, I, I think it's really difficult to do a fair comparison between different model classes. But you know more about this than me. So um, what do you think we should do? I think that it, it does require not just one case study, it needs a lot of case studies where we can look at these different modeling approaches and see what's the minimal assumption that's necessary for a certain level of complexity in the decision problem. Prostate cancer, you might need a DES to make a robust decision, but cohort markup might be fine with decision so, three. So I think um, I've always, I think the CISNET um, in the US, they've done some very nice work where they've sort of like um, brought together different modelers and sort of like sort of like compared predictions um, for cancer screening. Um, the challenge there is that the um, US doesn't like to talk about costs. Um, and so if you want to talk about differences in effectiveness, then I think that that sort of multi um, multi model approaches have been 
very successful. But if you, you want to talk about the, the differences in cost e effectiveness, that's not helpful. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think I think multiple models is a huge task, but it's actually quite, quite nice to bring those together. I still have some concerns that I think if you put a bunch of modelers all together, I think they tend to converge on on their predictions, but I'm not completely convinced that it's accurate. I just think that you you reduce your your um, your your variance goes down. I'm just not sure if they're actually getting the right place. So yeah, I think that's a, a very interesting discussion. I do know Cisnet attempts to try and avoid convergence, and um, I think in terms of uh, reasons for time, we should probably move on. Even though I'm very interested in this discussion.